Okay, here's where I want to go in the next few minutes, and I'm going to move fast. So, kind of the overall theme of this message is Satan's settled scheme to silence eschatology and Israel. And uh, let me, before I get into it, I want to read maybe two emails, okay? And I, and I think some of you will identify with the nature of the emails. This first one, I'm leaving the name off this one, though she actually gave me permission. And she says, uh, my husband and I recently met at, with our elders to ask why we never hear teachings on various topics, including eschatology, or mention that Israel is still God's chosen people. We were so disappointed to hear them say that Bible prophecy is divisive and has so many differing views, therefore they will never teach it. And then she goes on to say, they said the most important thing was presenting the gospel, and that's what they will stick with. And then she closes, you know, what are we to do? Stay or fight for the real truth to be taught. Go try to find a solid church. Our hearts are heavy, knowing if we stay and continue to teach a literal reading of God's word, we probably will be asked to leave. Let me read another short email here. Patrice writes, uh, I just read in your print newsletter, um, an article there and want to thank you for your article on the remnant church. You hit the nail on the head and everything you write about that the church I am experiencing at my church. I feel so alone, no one wants to discuss events of the day, certainly not eschatology. If I mention these things, people shudder. Uh, another one says, my husband and I are visiting churches. We've found uh, not one that addresses important issues. Some of the churches have gotten angry and asked that I not come back. I feel like crying when I leave. I sit and there, but I wonder why they never talk about what's going on, what's happening in Israel, or the intensifying birth pangs. One more. My church has no excitement about prophetic fulfillment applicable for today. When I bring up what I learn on your radio broadcast, I am put down. I am so lonely for like-minded believers. Which is why I believe today and last year as well and last number of years we end up with folks from 45, 48 states because you feel a little bit like the members of these remnant churches, remnant believers trying to find a church, that we are living in the time with the most significant things happening in history, particularly as they relate to the end of the church age, the most significant time, bar none. And yet, hardly anyone paying attention to it, starting with the church. Why? Why? Why has a topic that even uh, 30 years ago was still fairly popular vanished? Well, I believe, you know, in, in a sentence, it is Satan's subtle scheme to silence eschatology. And it's Satan's subtle scheme to silence things that are so important in our day. And I want to, first I want to talk about sort of <clears throat> people longing to know the future. And they, if they don't learn it properly, you know, biblically, they're going to seek it in all the wrong places. They're, they're simply going to, they're going to seek it in, uh, if they don't find it in Bible prophecy, they're going to seek out Nostradamus. They're going to seek out psychics. They're going to seek out occultists. As Amir gives the illustration, when he's walking down the streets of New York City, he sees two things, restaurants and psychic or paranormal shops. People want to know the future. Even the secular world is talking about the future. Newsweek magazine what the Bible says about the end of the world. And of course, if the secular world gets a hold of it, it's going to get twisted and not have any kind of biblical truth whatsoever. So sort of the, the theme today, or the mentality today, would be this, I think. Jesus isn't coming back. That's the slide in front of me. Jesus isn't coming back. Or in the church, it would probably be, come Lord Jesus, but not too soon. And I'll kind of get into why that's happening here in just a moment or two. And I think the root of the issue is probably this. And that is Satan hates what God loves. And without a doubt, God has a special love. He's got a love for lots of things, but he loves two things. He loves 
the prophetic theme, or it wouldn't be a fourth of our Bible if he didn't love it. And obviously, he loves God's, his chosen people, Israel, and the plan that he has unfolded for them, history, present, future. And he wants us to be excited and interested as well. A couple of uh, biblical exhortations here. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. That is what Bible prophecy is, okay? It is a lamp shining in a dark place. And without it, like J.D. Farag and I say, we would go out of our minds without this kind of hope. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has the mind of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. This is the future, and the future for the believer is glorious. The future for the unbeliever is, oh, oh, big trouble. But for the believer, it is glorious. And it's all wrapped up in eschatology. Eschatology warns us in advance which I think is extremely helpful. That may not be totally specific, but he certainly warns a lot, a lot of us about a lot of things in advance, which is so helpful. Eschatology and Israel reveal the following. And I mean, I, we could you know, have a 500-page book full, but a few things here. God keeps his promises. They remind us God is a miracle worker. They remind us God has a special plan. They remind us that God is in control. And as a world is literally spinning out of control, and you know it is, it's literally spinning out of control. I think one of the last straws for me was Israel's recent uh, election fiasco, which is going to be ongoing, but nonetheless, instability is everywhere is all I'm saying. And it's so comforting to know that God, everything is under control. Things aren't falling apart, they're falling into place, okay? Um, there are far more than trials and heartaches today, thankfully. And uh, eschatology gives perspective to the trials and the troubles of this age. And believe me, I know everyone here has come in with a burden, every single one of you. And we have that eternal perspective, thankfully, to get us through some of these extremely difficult times. How many of you have had it with things like this? I can't take it much more. I can't take it much more. But I know that any minute a trumpet is going to blow and I'm going to be removed from this scenario. Yeah. This world has been given over to a complete Romans 1 mentality, depravity. That little two-year-old child there is looking at somebody. She knows what's wrong with this picture. The little two-year-old gets it. The mother doesn't. The mother thinks this is the coolest thing in her life to expose that little two-year-old to tolerance and diversity. But the little two-year-old gets it. She says, what am I doing here, Mom? This is a creepy guy I'm looking at. I can figure that out. Why can't you? <laughs> or New York Times cheers 12-year-old drag queens, OK? It's time we leave this place, all right? And it's, it's, the, it's the word of eschatology that is our encouragement because he is coming, and he is going to deliver us, and he's going to judge this world just as he judged the time of Noah. He's going to judge it. He's going to say, I believe God is in the, in, the, in the heavens looking down just as he did during the days of Noah. And he said, I'm bringing that to an end, the days of Noah. I'm going to bring this to an end by sending my son, Jesus Christ. And the church is gone, and then he judges the world in the terrible tribulation. Okay, uh, why don't pastors want to deal with this? And once again, I'm 
borrowing from Pastor Tom Hughes. He's Calvary Chapel in San Jacinto, 412 Church, San Jacinto, California. Tom wrote an article, kind of went viral. This is maybe four or five years ago. Here's some of the reasons we're not hearing this. Some of the reasons you literally have driven or flown from the ends of the earth to be here because it's hard to find, okay? Number one, pastors don't understand it. It is true, seminaries have dropped this. I think Dallas Seminary may be a holdout, maybe a couple of others, but um, by and large, seminaries are not teaching it, and if they are teaching it, I guarantee you they're teaching it wrong. They're going to push amillennialism or who knows what, preterism, kingdom now, whatever. They're going to teach it kind of screwball. They're afraid of offending people. This is the second reason that the churches are afraid of offending they are afraid that they will scare members. We're not trying to scare anyone, we're trying to prepare them. Not scare them, we're trying to prepare them. But pastors see this as sort of a message that will scare because, okay, the trials of Revelation, they're pretty horrific. I, I look at these climate people that have been demonstrating for a day or two here all around the world apparently, you want climate change? Just wait till the tribulation. Man, are you going to get it? <laughs> Holy mackerel. <mess. laughs> That's when you got a problem, folks. <laughs> I'd like to see what AOC is going to do. What kind of a plan? <laughs> what kind of plan is she going to come up with? What kind of a what, the Green New Deal? What kind of a new deal is she going to come up with in tribulation? I promise you she will. I promise you she will. Okay, people might not tithe if they think we're near the end. Again, this is... <laughs> this is Tom Hughes. I'm, the article went viral, okay? So, in other words, if you've got a building program for 20 years, I'm not going to get behind the pulpit and say, the Lord's coming back tomorrow. We've got a building program, okay? Okay, and lastly, they are ashamed, and they have every right to be ashamed of the loony fringe in the world of eschatology. There have been way too many. They are an absolute embarrassment from the date setters to, I mean, the Herald campings, the, I mean, Edgar Weisenhunt back in 1988, 88 reasons, the Lord's coming back and it didn't happen. Whoops, uh, here's a new calculation, 89 reasons, he's coming back in 1989. This is totally embarrassing, okay? Totally embarrassing. All right, but the scoffing. This event here, where I believe some will get saved this weekend, is called an end time hysteria conference, and this is written by a Christian, but again, the mockers and the scoffers, 2 Peter 3. And in the article online, for centuries, Bible prophecy pundits have predicted that the end was near. They appealed to the same types of signs, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, and false religions. They all had one thing in common. They're all, they've all been wrong. Um, well, that's coming from a Christian website, making fun of an event like, you know, it's kind of, I think it's rather harmless, but nonetheless. Now, this is Fox News, or rather uh, an article talking about Fox News. Fox News promotes end-time nonsense. Leave it to Fox News to have a serious segment on a news show devoted to the question of whether bombing Syria would be a fulfillment of biblical prophecies. Neil Cavuto brought on Joel Rosenberg, one of many end-time preachers, pushing this nonsense, and actually, they took him seriously. So again, all predicted. This should not surprise us whatsoever. Again, I, Rob Bell. Rob Bell says, I would argue that in the last couple hundred years, disconnection has been the dominant way people have understood reality, and the church has contributed to that disconnection by preaching horrible messages about being left behind and that this place is going to burn. Absolute toxic messages that are against the teachings of Scripture. I'm not sure how you can take incidences that are literally in the Bible and say that that's toxic scripture. Yes, the world is going to burn, and yes, people are going to be left behind tragically. And then you've got, and I've played this before, some of this isn't new news to you, I'll play Hank Hanegraaff here. Hank, uh, for 30 years, has been on the radio confusing people, undoing things Walter Martin I mean, Walter Martin started the Bible Answer Man, and Handegraaff came along, I think it was 1989. 
and distorted, particularly distorted, everything to do with eschatology in Israel. And for 30 years, he has influenced literally millions and millions of Christians. What I'm trying to understand is where do they get the teaching that the church will be ratcheted out and will not have to go through tribulation? Where is that found at? It's not found. That's the whole point. The, the, the point is it's something that is imposed on the scripture. The notion is a very new notion in church history. It's a 19th century notion that was popularized by John Nelson Darby. And it comes with the presupposition that God has two distinct people. And therefore, he has two distinct plans for the two distinct people. And he has two distinct phases of the second coming and two distinct destinies. This, however, is an imposition on Scripture because the truth of it is God has only always had one chosen people, one covenant community, beautifully connected by the cross and illustrated by a cultivated olive tree uh, in, in, in Paul's letter to the Romans. So uh, the point here is that all those who are followers of Jesus Christ are the one chosen people. And this is prior to the cross as well, because all that look forward to Christ prior to the cross are God's covenant chosen people. And the covenant chosen people are made up of people from every tongue and language and nation and people. You're not a son of Abraham uh, because of some genealogical construction. You are a son of Abraham because you believe in the God of Abraham. Okay, in two minutes, he both, he demolished both Bible prophecy and God's chosen people. And that go, he, he's done that every day for 30 years. In two minutes, he completely undone, undid everything. And people buy into it. They, they don't know any better. Their churches aren't teaching them, so they're going to the other sources where they can learn. Unfortunately, they're learning some horrific things uh, Hanegraaff is a preterist. He believes all prophecy is history. It happened in 70 AD. Who knew? We, we, we missed it. Who, who knew? It all, it all happened. Seven, in 70 AD, that was the tribulation, the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, Nero, I believe, was the Antichrist. That's what a guy like Hank Hanegraaff believes. But again, the damage over time is incalculable. Bible prophecy is the best witnessing tool we have. It helps us live holy in an unholy age. Again, why on earth would something that helps us live holy in an unholy age be seen as divisive, controversial? We might offend people with it. It's Satan's subtle scheme to silence these issues in the church and keep the believer uninformed about things to come. It's a warning to unbelievers, flee the wrath and judgment that is to come. I believe there's at least one here today who's going to have their eyes opened and say, I do want to flee the wrath and judgment that is to come. And things that are going on are a good warning. It can be a warning to believers. I'm going to say more about this as I close, but I believe that the birth pangs intensifying it, yes, the birth pangs of the tribulation, quite frankly, make the events of today, the natural disasters pale in significance. I mean, the, the, the catastrophes of the tribulation, they're incalculable. And as the Bible says, if Jesus didn't return in the second coming, no flesh would be saved. So you can't really compare the birth pangs of the tribulation to today. But nonetheless, they're terrible. And I believe they're a warning to, to believers. And as I close, I'm going to just say another word about that. Some more reminders, though. This is our only hope in hopeless times. It spells out our glorious future. It helps us be focused on eternal issues, not our best life now. In other words, an eternal perspective. And how many preachers, heavily the prosperity preachers, are telling you can, you can have your best life now? You can't, okay? But that's the kind of the theme in a lot of our churches. And if you're going to talk our, about our best life now, you're sure not going to talk about things to, the glorious things to come because these people's eyes are on the present, not the future. Okay, uh, 
we have victory over sin and unrighteousness. More reminders, we are not destined for wrath. We have comfort and hope and can encourage one another, Hebrews 10. If there's anything you do today, if there's one thing you haven't done, I hope that you will do, is just before the day is over, go to somebody and say, I want to encourage you, okay? However the Lord leads you to encourage them. Um, I've been personally been encouraged back here by a number of people, and it is so uplifting. It is so, it's so encouraging to be encouraged, okay? Hebrews 10 exhorts us to do that, and, and because of the comfort and the hope we have in the any minute return of the Lord, that's how we need to be encouraging people. Um, we are promised a blessing. How about that? Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near, Revelation 1, 3. So we are promised a blessing. Um, if you love, as a matter of fact, uh, I believe in Dr. Jeffress, who's gone now. He flew back to be with his church in Dallas. He's just started a series on Revelation, morning service. And they're all promised a blessing, just studying that book. And then a crown awaits those who love his appearing. And I hear so many people say, well, you know, I'm, like, I'm not going to have any rewards in heaven, which probably isn't true at all. But 2 Timothy 4, 8, henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. I know, I'm sure 95, if not 98% of you love his appearing, long for his appearing. And you are going to be going to be rewarded. Okay, so the church has just about across the board, with some exceptions, thankfully. I again I read you some emails here. I could read literally thousands saying the same thing. Uh, my church has decided to drop you know things that are really relevant and replace it with things that make us feel good. Um, they've dropped another issue here, and I just want to spend an extra minute on it, because it says in Psalm 102, 13, you will arise and have compassion on Zion, for it is a time to be gracious to her. The appointed time has come. Okay, this is Israel. You will arise and have compassion on Israel. Now, not only is the church having no compassion on Israel, um, She's, she's ignoring it like the eschatology, Satan's subtle scheme has gotten the church to silence eschatology and Israel issues, Israel-related issues. There's an appointed time. There's a time to have compassion on Zion. Now, is the appointed time, 1948, I don't know, is the appointed time, maybe the millennium when they get all the promises that they were ever promised, including the greater land, et cetera, is it the millennium? Is it right now? Maybe it's all of those things, but there's a time to be gracious to Zion, not a time to sort of collectively wash our, the speaking of the church, collectively just wash our hands of Israel and just instead teach some very, very serious, dangerous doctrine. Okay, whoever would have thought, I mean, Israel, God keeps his promises. That's what's so glorious about this message. It shows how God is a covenant maker and a covenant keeper. And if he's going to keep his covenant with Israel, he's going to keep his covenant with you. Whoever would have thought in a hundred years Israel would go from malarial swamplands to being the eighth most powerful country in the world. Do you think Theodore Herzl in 1897 could envision Israel? Didn't it exist then? He said it will exist in 50 years, and he was right. But you think he ever would have thought it was going to become the eighth most powerful country in the world? I think that's worth talking about, church. I really do. Because it's a faith builder. God keeps his promises. That's all. He keeps his promises. And so they have to be stopped. The Jews must be stopped. Kings, generals, presidents, Arab sheiks, world leaders, United Nations, European Union, anti-Semites, Ilhan Omar, AOC, Rashida Tlaib are trying to, they won't succeed. Can't do it. Don't even try. Well, they will keep trying, but they will not ever succeed. But they're, they must be stopped. We must stop Israel. The Messiah would come from the Jews. Satan has always felt he has to stamp them out. 
First prophecy given Genesis 3. The offspring of the woman is going to crush the head of Satan. From that day forward, he knew he had to wipe out the Jews. Whoever would have thought, though, that part of the plan, that Satan's settled scheme, would be to silence the church and not talk about it. Or get involved in, in theologies that are, are horrific and marginalize the Jewish people. For Satan, the destruction of Israel is a matter of self-preservation. Okay? It's part of his subtle scheme. It's a matter of self-preservation. Here are some of the theologies that have come along. Um, I would say in the last, I don't know, 100 years, and they've been picking up steam in more recent decades. And the worst one, of course, is replacement theology. The church is the new Israel. We can thank Augustine for that and just about every mainline Protestant uh, denomination believes this, the Catholic Church believes this, uh, more and more even evangelicals are embracing this as well. The church is the new Israel. Israel was disobedient, the promises were taken away from her and given to the church. Is that a covenant keeping God? I'm sorry, I don't get it, but most of the church believes this. Or they believe in dual covenant theology, and that is that the Jews have a special covenant uh, they are saved apart from Jesus. They don't need Jesus to be saved. Now, folks, I was in the auditorium of a church in the northwest suburbs here five, six, seven, eight years ago. I won't name it. The pastor came to the end of the platform, and he wagged his finger at the audience, and he said, we do not witness to Jews around here. And he had a terribly scowling look on his face. And basically, because they teach dual covenant, the Jews have a separate covenant in the Old Testament. We don't have to bother sharing the gospel with them and we won't and don't because he was adamant about that and I hope some of the things that Amir shares including his testimony show you how absolutely foolish that is. Amillennialism, you know I could do a whole afternoon on amillennialism which allegorizes everything um, every, everything in, in, in Revelation is allegorical, nothing is literal in other words, nothing is literal and again, we're going to disinherit Israel with amillennialism. And when you're going to a new church, I mean, you want to ask some of these questions. What do you believe about the, the book of Revelation? What do you believe about a literal tribulation, about a literal antichrist, about a literal return of the Lord? Because if they say, well, we don't believe in those things, we take all those things uh, in the amillennial way, they, you don't want to go there because everything that they teach is going to be twisted if we can't take it literally and we have to allegorize it. And another one is kingdom now, dominionism. And um, that would puts all the emphasis on the church. The church is going to make the world perfect. We don't need Israel. Set Israel aside, please. The church, the church is going to make Israel perfect. And then the Lord I can return. Now, I want to play one more clip here. And again, this is coming from the church. This is a stunner. You're all sitting down. That's good. Um, <laughs> there's a, an internet radio, a TV program. Uh, it's Rick Wiles. True news. It's not true news. It's false news. Go run the other direction. But they identify as evangelical Christian. And I would say in most of their doctrine, they, they would be. But do you know what they think about Israel? I'm going to give you an illustration here. It takes about two minutes. Um, hold your breath. When they call Jerusalem the eternal capital of Israel, they're replacing God with Jerusalem because they're saying Jerusalem is eternal. There's only one thing that's truly eternal, and that's God the Father. That's the only one, the only one. And so if you're watching this today and you say, Doc, I have never seen it before. I've never understood it before. What do I do? You need to repent right now. You need to call out to God right now and say, God, I, Lord, I'm so sorry. I don't know how I was so deceived. I don't know how I was so bewitched 
by, by all of this. I thought it was a good thing to support the people of Israel. I thought it was a good thing to help Israel. But now I see it's just people using the name of Israel, people using the people of Israel in order to line their own pockets, in order to build their own kingdoms, in order to make themselves feel important. But Lord, right now I repent. I turn away from it. I look the other way now. Jesus, you are my Zion. Jesus, you are my Zion. Jesus, you are my promised land. Jesus, you are my temple. Jesus, you are my eternal capital, Lord. Amen. Right now in the name of Jesus, if you've said that and you've turned away from that, then the Lord's going to begin to do a work in your heart and your life. You're all bewitched. You're bewitched. If you're pro-Israel, God's got to do a new work in your heart. And if you prayed that prayer, he's begun to do a new work in your heart so that you can become among the Israel haters of the world. This coming from evangelical Christianity. Well, it's kind of making my point. Evangelical support for Israel declining, especially among millennials. Millennial evangelicals on Israel, ah, we're into social justice, okay? We're into, the Palestinians are persecuted. Palestinians have, are having a rough time because of Israel, so that's our cause now. That's the way the younger people are thinking. Well, the Presbyterian Church goes a step further. They stand with Ilhan Omar. <laughs> Presbyterian Peace Fellowship, stand, we stand with Ilhan. Ilhan Omar hates Israel more than she hates anything else on this planet other than maybe America. So is there any hope for the uh, PCUSA? Maybe not. Uh, Presbyterian Church goes full Nazi with new boycott. Can you imagine? What are the, what are the Jews who are watching these headlines thinking? My goodness. I thought, I thought Christians were our friend, but they're saying some terrible things. It's because of Satan's subtle scheme to silence this topic from the pulpits so that the pulpits aren't telling you the truth. And people who aren't hearing the truth don't know who to believe, and they're going to easily believe the false source. The battle for young evangelicals' views on Israel could determine the future of U.S. policy. And this, if the Lord should tarry 10, 20 years, I doubt that he will, but if he should, Indeed, because of the likes of, of clowns like this, yes, future U.S. policy is going to be affected. They are committed to de the destruction of Israel. This are the so-called squad, or as uh, Lori Cardoza Morris calls them, the, the Three Stooges plus one. <laughs> they need the Lord. They, ne they need the gospel. They really do. They're, they're so spiritually blind. They're so spiritually blind. Okay, now, here's why it's important. The tribulation is Jewish. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, we're not going to be here. All right, that doesn't mean we shouldn't understand what's going to be happening during that time. Some of you are going to have loved ones left behind. Okay, there is a Jewish temple, okay? It's not a Mormon tabernacle. It's a Jewish temple. Okay? The Jewish temple is desecrated in the tribulation. 144,000 Jewish evangelists are evangelizing the entire globe. Okay, that's not 144,000 from the Southern Baptist Convention. They're not from the Assemblies of God. They're not from the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church. There are 144,000 Jews evangelizing the globe, saving the souls of millions of people. And yet the church, because of Satan's subtle scheme, does not want to talk about any of that. They are, the Jews are saved during the tribulation, and Israel is the center of activity. I, I, I'll tell you a story, a true story. A pastor friend I have that I used to speak in his church, and I love this man, and I think he just turned 90 this week, and, and uh, he, we used to kind of spar with each other, and I would tell him, you know, Pastor, um, uh, Norway isn't the Holy Land. You know, Oslo isn't the Holy City, and he, oh, yes, it is. And, and, he, and then he would say, he would say, well, um, you know, and I, I really, and I don't go along with, with some of your Hal Lindsey type theology. I mean, we, this was all in good natured. We loved each other. 
and it was all good-spirited, so nothing hostile here. But he would say, you know, I don't go along with your Hal Lindsey theology. And I said to him, now, Pastor, any day you and I are going to go up together in the rapture. And what are you, you're going to protest all the way up, aren't you? You're going to protest <laughs> that this wasn't something Martin Luther taught you. So you're not even going to believe it when you're going up. <laughs> At le again, we did it in good nature, good spirited. Unfortunately, that's rare because generally today it's mean spirited. And we were talking back in the back room back there about some of the biggest heartache that Christian leaders experience today are the attacks from within. The attacks from within from other believers, and you saw a couple of clips there. But the specific attacks coming against some of us specifically for what we believe, and YouTubes are made, and lies are told, and accusations, and they're just off the chart. And that's all, that's you know, kind of signs of the times too, but it hurts, it, it hurts a lot when, when that goes on, particularly when everything they said, nothing is true that they're talking about. Okay, so if Satan could wipe out the Jews, he could thwart God's plan of the ages. That's the basic bottom line. That's, that's his sentiment, if he could just wipe out the Jews. And boy, has he tried, from Pharaoh to the pogroms to the Spanish Inquisition of the 1400s to the Holocaust, so you name it, he has tried and tried and tried and tried to wipe them out. And as he's never, never very successful. So basically, what you and I believe we're being accused of as Christian Zionists we're on the road to Armageddon. We're leading the world to Armageddon. I say, bring it on, okay? Bring it on. Let's get this show on the road and get it over with. <laughs> and, bring it, and have the Lord's second coming and the millennium set up. But this is a silly accusation that what we believe, a silly, silly accusation that what we believe is bringing us closer and closer to Armageddon. It's God's timing that will bring the world to Armageddon, and it's probably man's depravity that will bring... Uh, the world to Armageddon, and God's going to say, enough, enough of the child drag queens, I'm coming, I'm sending my son back. Okay, I'm going to play one more clip here, and if you think that some of this anti-Semitic stuff isn't really going off the chart, this is just a very short little clip, this was in Belgium recently. A carnival float at a parade in Belgium has caused outrage for displaying giant caricatures of Jews sitting on bags of money. The float's creators claim they were simply following carnival tradition with their contribution and say they had no anti-Semitic intentions. But an EU Commission spokesperson was incredulous. It is unthinkable that these images parade in European streets. Well, could that come to America? You bet it can come to America. That's why you need to support Lori's ministry. Uh, this is just... Uh, I'm, this is the shooter of the Poway Synagogue in California. I'm defending our nation against Jews, he said. So he's the one who shot up that synagogue some months ago. Jew hatred also describes anti-Semitism becoming mainstream in America, and it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. So, again, part of that is the pulpits are silent. Satan's subtle scheme to silence a message like this. He silenced the pulpits, not all of them, thankfully but a lot of them are silent to the things that would teach people that God's love for Israel is eternal, they're the apple of his eye, and that we need to be fulfilling Genesis 12, 3, blessing them, and then we will be blessed in turn. And here's the thing. Uh, Jeremiah 31, 35 through 36, they're not going away until the fixed order of the universe departs from me, then the offspring of Israel shall cease from being a nation. I'm going to borrow a line from Amir in one of his teachings, why uh, Christians should love and support Israel. I'm sure he has that back there. But if the mullahs of Iran want to destroy Israel, they should take their rockets and aim them at the sun and the moon and the stars to knock them out of the heavens. Then Israel will be destroyed. Until then, not going to happen. Not going to happen.
How odd of God to choose the Jews, but not so odd as those who choose the Jewish God, but spurn the Jews. I don't fully understand it. I mean, I've developed a message here, but I don't fully get it, other than it's a satanic thing going on. Satan is very much alive and well, and he's in overdrive as he sees his time literally drawing short. So the second coming, what happens at the second coming? God's grace is extended to Israel. Jesus takes the throne in Jerusalem, not Washington, D.C., not New York City, not Oslo, but in Jerusalem, he takes the throne. Satan is stripped of his authority and is locked up. Don't you want to be in the front row when that happens? Yeah, want to be in the front row. And Jesus begins his millennial reign in Jerusalem. Again, not Paris, not Cairo, not Minneapolis, but in Jerusalem. And that and literal Jerusalem, not some spiritualizing of that, which is what that uh, film clip was a few minutes ago. He was spiritualizing everything. So, um, <clears throat> Bible prophecy in Israel reminds us God is a covenant keeper. If he could break his covenant with the Jews, he could break his covenant with the Christian. And we know he's not going to break either one. It, that should be, again, these are faith builders. That's all I'm saying. Uh, to look at eschatology and look at how God deals with Bible prophecy and how he deals with Israel should be a faith builder, should be an encouragement to you. And again, somebody, a friend of mine said just this week, said, Jan, I'm done. I'm through. I'm not going to talk about these kinds of issues. And people, they laugh at that. They've heard it for 30 years and they won't accept it. And I'm just done. Don't. Don't. Don't give up. Don't give up. Please keep going. Because if you don't tell them, who will? Who will? If the pulpits won't tell them, then I don't know who will. I mean, there are some wonderful online teachers. We'll say more about that a little bit later. Some wonderful online teaching. But again, um, if the pulpits are basically silent, then we need to make up for that. Let's just look at a few current events that I think we should keep our eyes on. We're heading towards the end of another year. I know it happens fast. Uh, So what are some things that I think we should be watching? And we had a wonderful Middle East lesson this morning by Amir, so I don't have to review that for sure. But that is, of course, is the epicenter. And a big shakeup in Israel going on, which is going to affect the whole Middle East, which is going to embolden Iran which is going to possibly literally make the whole world again unstable. How can, how can a nation the size of New Jersey make the world completely unstable? Well, it can and it will. It can and it will. Because Iran is probably going to do something in the near future. It, it could be today or tomorrow. This picture, which I have used quite often, Iran's Rouhani, Vladimir Putin, and Turkey's um, Erdogan, as, as, as J.D. Farag says, Bible prophecy has a shelf life. This picture, it's, it's a setup for Gog-Magog alignment. It's probably being planned. It's probably in the works as we're speaking. These three may not even be friends in five years, or one of them could be out of the picture. Look, before 1979, Iran was a Western ally. The Shah of Iran was a friend. The Shah of Iran wasn't sitting around planning how we could annihilate Israel. He was a friend of the West. Then Jimmy Carter blew it and allowed the Shah to fall and allowed Ayatollah Khomeini to come into power. And that has caused the setup for the Gog Magog invasion any day, any day. So keep your eyes on that. Keep your eyes on the <laughs> fulfillment of 1 Thessalonians 5 3 when they say peace and security then sudden destruction will come. We are seeing the terms peace and security or peace and safety, some versions say, everywhere. The UN has a plan to restore international peace and security. African Union, peace and security. The UN General Assembly celebrates 20 years promoting a culture of peace and security. It's right out of the Bible. I think that this is very foretelling. This summit was just less than a year ago, the Peace and Security in the Middle East Summit in Poland. So again, um, 
words from the Bible leaping out as I open this presentation. We're living in the time when these kinds of events that we're talking about are the most profound and prolific with the least amount of interest. Never been this little interest before. Okay, let's keep our eyes again on days of Noah and Lot type behavior. And that would include um, terrible corruption and the collapse of the culture. That would include Isaiah 5.20, evil being called good and good being called evil. That would be a focus on self and money. These are characteristics that are going to just continue to explode. Obviously, they're going to fully explode in the tribulation. But you see, tribulation signs are casting a shadow now. That's why they're important. Loving what God hates. This is the kind of behavior that exists today. Look, if your parents' generation were around, what would they think of uh, this little two-year-old being taken to, to, to stare at a man who's dressed up like a woman? You know, our parents' generation couldn't get over it. Uh, the rise of evil and lawlessness and the rise of strong delusion. And I think this rise of strong delusion, and again, I saw it in some of the demonstrating, again, the, the climate agenda things going on the last few days, and uh, who controls the climate? God controls the climate, but the world has bought the lie that man controls the climate. That's strong delusion. John Kerry said recently, well, uh, climate change is far more dangerous than um, terrorism. Well, that's, that's strong delusion. That's delusional thinking, that's upside down thinking, and that's what's going on. That's characteristic of end time behavior. Watch that continue to absolutely skyrocket off the chart. Uh, the 58 gender options for Facebook, these kinds of things, this is the new normal. This is not an aberration, this is the new normal. This is the new normal. These kids, BBC video tells children there are more than 100 gender identities. How, how confused is this, yeah, these, this generation of children? They, they, they can't figure this out. I mean, I think some of them instinctively know things aren't right, but many of them are... Okay, how about this obsession that men can have babies? Again, <laughs> this is delusional thinking, and it's part of the warning signs. It's a warning to you, it's a warning to the church. If nobody else is paying attention, the church should be paying attention to this kind of behavior because it's predicted. It's predicted for our last days. This kind of activity is predicted for our last days. So don't get totally, completely discouraged by it. It's, you know, it's a herald of his coming. Things aren't falling apart, they're falling into place, okay? Uh, this kind of activity, to little children, can you imagine parents being thrilled with their two-year-old saying something like this. Again, it's totally delusional thinking. Delusional thinking. And it's predicted, it's an end time phenomenon, and it means our time. Again, God is going to say hey, to his son, it's time you go and take the church out of here because I can't take this anymore. Just like the days of Noah. Couldn't take it, he ended it. He's gonna return, Jesus is gonna return going to put an end to this during that seven-year tribulation. At the end of the seven-year tribulation, we all come back. So it's similar to the days of Noah. Uh, keep your eye on something I find totally fascinating, and that is many of the Jews, not all, but many of them just cannot wait to have their temple built, the third temple. Now remember, that's the temple where the Antichrist goes in at three and a half year point of the tribulation, the first part of the tribulation, he's their friend. Then he goes into this temple and he defiles it and says, you worship me now. And of course, then uh, literally all hell breaks loose, though I, I personally believe it breaks loose the minute the Antichrist seizes power at the beginning of the tribulation. It's just he befriends the Jews at first. And then he defiles their temple. So they want this rebuilt. Elections pro third temple party gets decisive boost in polls. Will new Israeli government begin building the third temple after the elections? This is just the talk. And uh, will Trump enable third temple construction? So and so sees last day's structure going up as part of the Mideast peace plan. 
Well, you know, that so-called Mideast peace plan just keeps getting put on hold because the Israelis can't even get, have an election and find, find a leader, let alone have this Mideast peace plan come and present it to a leader because their elections kind of turn up with nothing. Now there's two, there could be even a third. Um, again, let's keep our eye on the rush to globalism, one worldism. There's one man really standing in the way right now, and that's Donald Trump. Trump urges the world to reject globalism. This is, the, I believe this is one of the reasons they want to get rid of him so badly, and I don't know if they even perceive it themselves, but he's standing in the way of Satan's plan, which obviously is God's in control of all that, God's in control of the timing of that. Uh, but Donald Trump, because he's an ardent nationalist and will not go along with globalist nonsense, he's standing in the way of a global effort, a satanic effort, and I go through that in a DVD I have in back, uh, Hidden in Plain View, The New World Order and Bible Prophecy. For 5,000 years, the Satan has tried to install the uh, end time one world system, and for 5,000 years, it's not worked. It will during the tribulation. They get seven ignominious years, whoopee. But uh, keep your eye on Europe. Europe is falling apart. Um, Europe on the brink of collapse. So keep your eye on Europe. And um, Time Magazine says, uh, the unraveling of Europe, how nationalists are joining together to tear Europe apart. Europe made a terrible mistake 50, 60 years ago, threw God out, and when they threw God out, um, God said, okay, then you try to do it on your own, and obviously nothing has, uh, immigration, you name it. And there are some very shady characters in Europe, and I believe Europe is what we should be watching. Um, as far as end time activity goes. If these two aren't a forerunner of some of the end time players, I, I don't think they're it, but I think they're certainly forerunners of the Antichrist and the false prophet. One more thing, then that I am finished, and that is the birth pangs, already referred to them. Again, the birth pangs of today, um, really almost inconsequential compared to what happens in the tribulation, but nonetheless, the birth pangs of today every year they're more apocalyptic as this headline says total devastation usually record setting usually the words are unprecedented record setting apocalyptic and the destruction here dorian destruction the worst natural disaster in modern history are they getting more intense i think so and i think that that's here's what i think that that is i think God is shaking us up, trying to wake us up so that we'll look up. That's the message to the church. Do you see these things? Would you wake up and look up? Even if the church is silent, would you wake up and look up? A storm of biblical proportion is on the horizon. The storm of biblical proportion is the day of the Lord. It is at hand. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. That's how bad the birth pangs are in the tribulation. If Jesus and all of us didn't come back at the uh, end of the tribulation, no flesh, no living thing would survive because of the calamities going on. So when you see certain things begin to happen, take shelter. Eschatology has warned us of these things in advance. But Satan's subtle scheme is to silence it all in the church. So we can't, we can't be silent. We simply can't be silent. Again, we're to always be ready, 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you. Don't stop talking about the blessed hope. I know it's falling on some deaf ears. Don't stop. I, I close with this little picture, and I think it says a lot. And for those who are listening and not watching, it is of the Lion King, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and there's a little uh, lion cub just born, and he's scared to death to take his first steps. And then he said, I thought about quitting, then I noticed who was watching. The Lion of Judah is watching him. The Lion of Judah is watching you.
So don't stop. You, you are that little lion cub there, that little firstborn little baby trying to take his first. He's scared to death. I thought about quitting. And then I noticed the Lion of Judah's watching me. May that be an encouragement for you. The Lion of Judah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords is returning, even perhaps today. Thank you. Thank you.